Welcome to our viewing audience. We're honored to welcome you to the International Leadership Conference, which is a global conference held by the Universal Peace Federation. Uh, this program is running from today, Thursday, June 24th, through June 26th, Saturday, and has a special session on Tuesday, June 29th. We're very uh, excited about the collaboration among heads of state, members of parliament, and experts on the area of peace, particularly with a focus on North and South Korea. The topic of our program today is the state of relations between the US, Russia, and China in relationship to the possible peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. We realize that only through cooperation of these stakeholder countries, including Japan also, and the uh, ROK, North Korea, Russia, China, and the United States, six parties have been engaged for many years. And that cooperation is going to be the key to bringing about a peaceful resolution. We have expert panelists today, uh, Mr. Doug Bondo, and also Mr. Guy Taylor, and Dr. Georgie Talaraya. Our first panelist today is Mr. Doug Bondo. Doug is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, specializing in foreign policy and civil liberties. He worked as a special assistant to President Ronald Reagan and editor of the political magazine, Inquiry. He writes regularly for the Washington Times, the Wall Street Journal, Harper's National Review, New Republic, and all uh, top level uh, journals of, of peace and also intelligence. He's also been featured by uh, all the major media and his column, La Prensa, Economic Freedom and the Press was syndicated by Copley News and Mencken Award. He won the Mencken Award for best editorial for op-ed column. Doug speaks frequently at academic conferences and also as a commentator, commentator on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, ABC, CBS. Dr. Ben Bondo writ, obtained his bachelor's degree in economics from Florida State University, completed his Juris Doctor in Stanford Law School in Palo Alto. He worked in the Reagan administration for several uh, years. In January 2006, Dr. Bondo joined the nonprofit Citizens Outreach as Vice President of Policy. He's a respected expert on the Northeast Asian uh, arena, and we are really excited to hear him now. Welcome, Mr. or Dr. Doug Bondo. Welcome, Doug. Dr. Jenkins, I thank you very much for you know, having me on this panel. It's a great pleasure to join my fellow panelists and you. <laughs> we obviously have some very important issues here. When we look at China and Russia, we're looking really at the two most important countries that the U.S. has to deal with. And when you put them together, they provide a potential uh, you know, strong combination against the United States. So it's important we try to get you know, these policies right. You, know, you look at the Cold War, you know, we were afraid in 1949 when China's uh, revolution happened that we would have to face the Soviet Union and China together. And we were lucky in the 1960s when they had a falling out. In 1972, you know, Richard Nixon you know, had his famous uh, trip to uh, China, met Mao Zedong, opened up a relationship, you know, and helped pull uh, China and the Soviet Union apart. And that was very important. You know, geopolitically, it helped you know, separate two of these very important powers that the U.S. was dealing with at the same time. And that really did transform the relationship. And the danger is today, it looks like we may be reversing that. You know, that is unintentionally, we are pushing these countries back together where we once were able to separate them. <laughs> I think we see a friendly relationship between the two. Now, it's not a military alliance, you know, that uh, you know, China especially would be very uh, you know, careful about that. <laughs> you know, they have very different interests in some cases. Uh, the issue of Siberia, for example, uh, Russia has a lot of concern, uh, not a very populated area. China likes all those resources, concern about, you know, potential transformation of, of the uh, Far East. 
you know, there are differences in Central Asia. It used to be part of the Soviet Union. China now has a lot of economic interests there and really is pushing Russia aside in certain ways. You know, on intellectual property is an issue where the Russians have faced some of the same problems that we have in dealing, you know, with China. You know, you look at uh, even more fundamentally, who is the senior partner when, uh, you know, there was the Chinese Revolution, it was the Soviet Union, it was Moscow. Today, it very much looks like Beijing is a senior partner. So there's a lot there that kind of keeps these countries apart. But at the moment, their concern about the U.S., uh, their uh, bad relationships with the U.S. have helped push them together. And it, you know, the danger is that we are allowing our policy towards them to kind of overcome the natural reluctance they have dealing with each other. And I think it's important to you know, realize nothing is set here. Now, there, you know, there are some folks out there who say that in many ways we can't do much about it. On one side, uh, there are people who argue that uh, in the end, Russia will realize that it can't trust China, that it doesn't matter what they're doing today, that in the end, uh, you know, Russia will move our way that Moscow will decide it's better to be with the U.S. and Europe than with China. You know, and that's certainly possible, but there's nothing guaranteed at the moment, at least. Vladimir Putin is quite happy, you know, to meet with Xi Jinping and to have them work together to accept that they have some differences, but nevertheless view, uh, you know, them as important allies working together against us. You know, the second side argues that there's nothing really we can do that they're always going to be together. And I think, again, that makes the same mistake, that nothing is guaranteed, you know, that the, both of these are very practical powers. I mean, neither of them is a communist country in the, the old Marxist-Leninist sense. You know, Russia is very nationalistic. You know, China is formally communist. I'd argue it's much more Leninist than Marxist-Leninist if you look at its economy and the way it behaves. So ideology doesn't drive them together. What pulls them together is antagonism towards the U.S., but that obviously can change. That we have choice, we have agency here. And I think we want to then look at our policies very carefully in terms of can we do things to try not to push these countries together? You know, they're very unlikely to form a formal military alliance. Nevertheless, if you look around the world, if they work together, there's a lot they can do together. They support each other, whether it be in the UN, geopolitically, economically, you know, in terms of energy, there are a lot of areas that they can be a fairly potent you know, uh, you know, counterpoint to the United States. If you look overall, China is the greater concern for us. It's the much bigger power. It uh, has the larger economy. But Russia, we don't want to underestimate. You know, Russia, I would argue, is a great power. It's not a superpower. It's no longer a globe-spanning power the way the, the Soviet Union was. But it has, it's rebuilt its military. It has a significant uh, nuclear threat. You know, its economy has, uh, you know, despite sanctions, has started to rebound some. You know, this is a country that, uh, you know, one has to take into account as well as China. If you look at Russia, you know, we have these days a very bad relationship, though the president had what appeared to be at least a fairly civil, um, you know, summit with Vladimir Putin. It's not the Cold War, but I think that it's important to realize that there are some very important differences between us, but not to oversell them, that there are opportunities here, I think, to try to work through at least enough of those that we can get the relationship on a somewhat better level. You know, it's a great power, and I think it wants to be treated like a great power. In many ways, I think that's the biggest issue here. It wants to be respected. It wants uh, to have a say in international relations, very concerned about its own security. And I don't see existential threats from it to the United States. I don't see it, the idea that Russia has any interest in war against us. We don't covet the same territory. What we see is Russia being very sensitive in terms of Europe, very nervous about uh, you know, whether countries like Ukraine and Georgia go into NATO. In many ways, I think that's probably the most important issue for them. Uh, there are other issues out there where we clash, but they tend to be more peripheral. What happens in Syria, for example, issues of North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, these issues matter, but they're not central really to either country. I think important are the issues of cybersecurity, cyber attacks and uh, elections. And they also, uh, you know, they're very bad on human rights. So this, of course, is no change, frankly, from the Soviet Union. So we need to look at trying, can we come up with some kind of modus vivendi to live together? I mean, and I think of ideas, for example, we promise that Ukraine and Georgia don't go into NATO and they get out of Donbass. I mean, is this a, a discussion that we might come up with that would help us stabilize Eastern Europe? You know, I don't think they're going to give up Crimea, but we might come up with a compromise where we're going to keep sanctions on Crimea itself. 
but we're going to accept the fact they're likely to keep it and we can move on to other issues. Issues of uh, you know, countries of Syria and others we're likely to disagree on, but we, there may be trades there we can make. You know, they stay out of Venezuela. We're not so concerned about what they do in Syria. I mean, there, I think there are places we can talk about some of these issues. I think cyber issues may be the biggest for us. These are threatening significant issues, as well as election interference, though, frankly, we have to recognize we do that too. We've interfered, interfered in a lot of elections, including the Russian election in 1996. So I think a little less sanctimony on our part would help. Human rights uh, is always going to be a tough issue. They're not gonna change that policy, I think, for us. You know, we're going to have to you know, confront them on the issue and accept the fact we're not likely to change them dramatically. My hope is that we can look at some of these issues and try to at least reduce the hostility that we see and in a way that we don't push them quite so clearly towards China. I think China is going to be a much tougher issue in many ways. Uh, China is the bigger uh, you know, issue for us, a much larger economy, a growing military, globe spanning interests, <laughs> much greater connections with frankly our allies and with friendly countries. You know, all of these issues, uh, you'll become much more complicated. The security issues I think are not direct against us. That is no one imagines the Chinese will attack us directly. It's an issue of US domination of East Asia. And uh, I think what we have to realize here in both Russia and China is we are expecting them to accept us intervening in their neighborhood in ways that we would never accept them doing to us. You know, imagine if the U if, uh, Soviet Union had invited Mexico to join the Warsaw Pact, the US would have been very unhappy. Imagine if the Chinese Navy was steaming up the East Coast, the US would not be happy. So we have to realize that these are going to create tensions between us. It's going to create problems for us. We have to decide how to try to work through those. I mean, what are we willing to do in terms of Taiwan? Are there ways to try to, you know, kind of bring these issues that, you know, down a little bit in terms of on both sides, de-escalating, question of security, uh, you know, so the territorial claims in East Asia, they're not our claims, they're our friends' claims. How involved are we going to be in those? A lot of economic issues, obviously, the President Trump got into, you know, trade, internet, intellectual property theft, cyber issues. I mean, there's a whole host of those issues as well. We will do better if we can work with our friends on those, the Europeans and Asian countries, put all of our us together. We have a lot more clout dealing with China. We need to look for cooperative areas. I think ultimately we want to play a long game with both these countries. I think uh, you know young people change things. I think if you look at what's going on in China, they have a lot of their own weaknesses. A, actually, a, a population about to shrink, an old population, a country that might grow old before it grows rich. We want to open up uh, information avenues in both these places. We want young people especially to have information, to be able to change the future, recognize their weakness. Even China has some significant weaknesses economically, politically. You know, these are not 800 pound gorillas. Let's play a long game here. Let's find ways to try to help uh, transform them internally. And let's emphasize peace. You know, at this century, what's critical is both these countries are very serious powers. So are we. This century will be a far better place if we avoid conflict with both of them. So we need to work on that, emphasize that, recognize we have differences, find ways to settle those differences uh, you know, together and you know, settle them peacefully, even if we are still somewhat at odds. It's going to be a great challenge. It's one I believe that we are up to. And I, uh, I think this foundation and discussions like this will be helpful in that endeavor. You know, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bondo. We uh, really, really thank you for this expert wisdom and experience. And I, I feel hope <laughs> from your discussion. And there always is hope. And that's how the Universal Peace Federation and the Washington Times Foundation, our co-sponsor, sees this. We, we want to find the elements of cooperation. Our next speaker today, Mr. Guy Taylor, is the national security team leader for the Washington Times. He's an award-winning foreign correspondent overseeing the Times State Department and intelligence community coverage. Mr. Taylor has engaged extensively in international reporting over the last 20 years from Latin America to the Middle East and Asia Pacific. He, his exhaustive and deep dive coverage of U.S. policy towards North Korea and also crisis areas has won accolades from across the political spectrum. His reporting on security, political, and economic developments in Mexico won a Virginia Press Association Award. His reporting on Russia's attempts to influence the 2016 U.S. election was recognized by the Gerald Ford Journalism. Uh, he received the Journal 
Journalism Prize from the Gerald Ford Institute, uh, Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency. Yesterday, Guy published in the Washington Times a very important article on North Korea's rejection of the Biden administration's efforts to engage in dialogue. And uh, we're very happy to present to you Mr. Guy Taylor of the Washington Times. Welcome, Guy. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, I presume you'll tell me if you can't uh, hear me clearly. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, on this esteemed panel. Um, I enjoyed Doug Bandow's comments right then. And, and thank you for to, to the Universal Peace Federation and to this International Leadership Conference. I think these dialogues are uh, immensely important to um, promoting peace and understanding what's going on uh, in the world. I, I have a, just a few framing remarks. I'll, I'll try to go through them succinctly. I, I, I think it's a, uh, very important to consider that great power interaction between the U.S., and China and, and what was the Soviet Union until 1991 and, and now with Russia has been occurring and, and evolving for many decades. Um, in the modern realm, a good place to start is the early years of, of uh, post-revolution China, which would really be the early 1950s as the US-Soviet Cold War was first emerging as the, the sort of organizing bedrock of global security or, or power arrangements. Um, as we look at today's landscape in 2021, whether we're talking about the global economy or global trade, ideological alliances or military uh, conflicts uh, between authoritarian autocracies or democracies or military friction or new aspects of the information age, who controls the the tip of the spear of artificial intelligence, for instance, who ultimately wields control over the uh, elusive informational in instrument of power, as it's been called, um, as the 21st century progresses. I, I think it's wise to, to slow down and uh, consider the history of the past 70 years or so as it relates to this three-way dynamic that we're trying to understand right now between Washington, Moscow, and Beijing. Alignments between the US and Russia, the US and China, and China and Russia have really shifted repeatedly during those seven decades. Whether it was the early China-Soviet alignment that, uh, that Doug ha has just mentioned, actually when Mao Zedong reached out to Moscow, uh, for clandestine Russian help in starting China's nuclear weapons program in the early 1950s. Or then the period of cooling by the late 1950s when, when the Chinese pushed the Soviets away uh, following some warm symmetry between Dwight Eisenhower and, and uh, Nikita Khrushchev. I think in 1959, Khrushchev came to, to the White House, came to Washington. And this kind of reversal again, just 12 years later during Nixon's uh, uh, 1971 trip to China, a moment when Washington sought closer alignment with China to gain leverage over the Soviets. Uh, that, of course, came after years of mounting U.S.-Soviet Cold War friction following the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Uh, if we were to jump ahead a couple of decades, we get to the end of the U.S.-Soviet Cold War in 1991. This was a monumental moment in the evolution of contemporary global power dynamics. I, I actually think this early Cold War history is instructive if we're looking for ways to understand today uh, in this kind of current moment of heightened concern in Washington over China's rise as an increasingly dominant economic power and an increasingly elusive global military power. I, I, to put it one way, we're really now in the midst of a new era where the dynamics have shifted again and the risks of conflict are uh, very real. I, I think if we consider, the, or, or if we look at the realists, so to speak, if we consider Graham Allison's famous essay six years ago, uh, in a subsequent, a subsequent book that Allison wrote, it's called the Thucydides, the Thucydides Trap, 
are the U.S. and China headed for war? This was a reference to the Greek philosopher, journalist Thucydides, who, who wrote of the Athenaean war against Sparta, ancient Greece, right? And the general principle is that the trap of war is nearly inevitable if we look at human history when a rising power uh, really rivals a ruling power. And in this case, uh, the U.S. being the ruling power and China being the, the rising power. Most economists around the world agree at this point that uh, Chinese economic power will dramatically outstrip that of the U.S. by 2050, if not sooner. Uh, of course, you know, I think there's a tendency to exaggerate those kind of predictions, so it's, it's debatable. I certainly think it's debatable, but it, it's something to consider as we try to get a, a clear snapshot of, of what the future may hold. Uh, predictions about China's continuing rise bring questions about three-way U.S.-China uh, dynamics going forward. In my reporting, for the Washington Times, I could see very clearly that this three-way dynamic loomed over the recent Biden-Putin summit. I heard it in conversations with strategic advisors to the Biden administration, and I could see it, uh, and actually wrote a couple of stories about this recently, I could see it in, in Chinese and Russian state media or propaganda reports during the days immediately leading up to the summit where we saw this kind of concerted Russian-Chinese effort to project unity between Moscow or, or an image of unity between Moscow and, and Beijing against the United States. This was interesting because recent years have seen a, a growing U.S. intelligence push uh, to try and gently drive a wedge between Russia and China or to perhaps win the Russians over to the U.S. side or convince Moscow that it, it may not be in Russia's interest at this moment of, uh, in history to cozy up with China strategically. From the Biden administration's perspective, uh, and I, I'm going to wrap it up pretty soon here, but from the Biden administration's perspective, there are, uh, there are many in the administration who believe this is a lost cause, this, that the Russians under Vladimir Putin are, are going to act in their own interests, not in Washington's. And if anything, they're bent on trying to undermine Washington's interests. With that in mind, the Biden administration uh, appears to uh, be eager to try and ease U.S.-Russian tensions, at least, in various theaters around the world, most notably the Middle East, Syria, and also Eastern Europe, Ukraine, albeit to a lesser degree in Latin America, Venezuela. But the goal, I think, is to is to try and free up U.S. foreign policy bandwidth to focus more exclusively on China and efforts to work with other partners such as major Asian democracies, India, Japan, and Australia toward really countering China's rise without being so distracted or sucked into quagmire proxy conflicts against the Russians, such as we saw for years in Syria and uh, we've seen in Libya recently and and a few other theaters. That being said, I think the, the third and, and kind of final element to, to all of this right now that, that's very important, uh, it has to do with what used to be called nuclear arms control, uh, but increasingly gets referred to today as just strategic stability. Strategic stability basically means the set of agreements that prevent the U.S. and Russia from lobbing nuclear bombs at each other or just generally racing to make more and more nuclear weapons and more advanced weapons. There's a problem right now in 2021 where the nuclear arms control architecture built up between the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the Cold War and then held in place between Russia and the U.S. during the initial aftermath of the Cold War is it's now eroding and it's become obsolete in the face of increasingly sophisticated weaponry being tested and deployed, not only by the Russians, but particularly in the past 10 years by the Chinese. Uh, they were never um, considered a great enough power to have been previously sewn into the established arms control architecture of the past. And this was actually a motivating factor behind the Trump administration's abandoning uh, and the Russian abandonment of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, in 2019, 
the fact that China was not part of it and may well right now be deploying intermediate range forces uh, around Asia or other parts of the world. This has also been a factor behind the slowness of U.S. Russian attempts to update the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. It's called START. That uh, Biden and Putin have agreed in recent months to essentially punt or or keep on the back burner these these renegotiation of START for at least the next five years. China is not party to START. China has more than 300 nuclear warheads. In the past, nobody really cared about that because China was not a great economic power. But now that China is or is becoming a great economic and diplomatic and increasingly informational power, uh, talking about cyber and and, uh, artificial intelligence, regardless of its human rights abuses, its lack of media freedoms, its sort of monolithic authoritarian communist government, It is a great power with nuclear weapons, and so it should bear the great responsibility of becoming beholden to the same nuclear arms control and reduction agreements that the other great powers are beholden to. Possibly Russia and the U.S. could see eye to eye on that. Uh, And of course, China has so far resisted any talk from Washington or Moscow about pushing China uh, to be part of a new INF or part of a new START treaty. I'm going to conclude here by by staying on this issue of nuclear weapons. I believe we have to take into consideration the immediate nuclear crisis in Northeast Asia, which is that involving North Korea, a rogue state that has built nuclear weapons for decades in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. North Korea has a border with just two countries other than South Korea, and those two countries are China and Russia. So any look at solving the North Korea crisis has to take into consideration the U.S.-China-Russia dynamic, as China and Russia both support North Korea. A question I often ask as a journalist writing about the day-to-day, week-to-week developments in geopolitics is, what is the strategic benefit for China and Russia to keep the North Korea crisis going? In other words, to not work with Washington toward pressuring the Kim regime in Pyongyang to denuclearize. It's an important question and it's a vexing question. It's difficult to answer with clarity beyond saying that for sure the North Korea issue will continue to be there in the midst of the evolving U.S.-China-Russia dynamic. I hope we can dive uh, further into this issue and in the, Q and, the Q&A session uh, coming here. I, I also want to say I enjoyed uh, Doug Bandow's comments a few minutes ago about um, how young people change things. You know, th- there's, that does give hope that the coming generations may seek peace in this dynamic. Uh, and I think it's important to talk about that as a possibility. I'm uh, going to conclude on that. I look forward to what others have to say, and I, I thank you very much for, for including me here. Thank you, Guy. Excellent presentation. And one point we did see from the Washington Times fact finders, there has been a dramatic change in the younger generation's attitudes towards North Korea and also towards America in a very positive way towards America. In the early part of the Bush administration, 2002, the uh, George W. Bush administration, there were some tragic incidents that occurred in America and, and South Korea in terms of the youth uh, could not be further apart. But somehow efforts made to really be more inclusive and careful uh, to communicate well have opened that door. Also, the youth in South Korea do not see North Korea as a model of, of hope for the future when they see that the lights are, are out at night and you can't see much there in terms of of the development of that nation. We'd like to see the development of that nation. The youth definitely play a great role. Thank you, Guy, for your excellent insights and comments and expertise. Next, we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Georgi Toloraya, is a former diplomat, rank of minister, and a scholar with decades-long experience on Asia and global issues. He concurrently is the director of Asian Strategy Center Center at the Institute of Economy of Russian Academy of Science. And he serves as CEO of the Russian National Committee on BRICS, BRICS Research. Since 2008, he has been working for the Rusky Mir, which is Russian world, 
Presidential Foundation in Moscow as chair of project and analysis, coordinating inter-Asian and African programs. Professor Tolaraya also teaches at the Moscow University of International Relations. He served two postings in North Korea, one in 1977 to 1980 and 1984 to 1987. He worked for trade promotion agencies related to Asia, served, the Russian foreign minister, served at the Russian Foreign Ministry, was deputy chief of the Russian embassy in South Korea. First day and part of the first Asian department, De deputy director general and consul general of Russia in Sydney, Australia. He collaborated with another, a number of academic institutes, including IMEMO and the Institute of Economics as a full-time and part-time researcher. In 2000, 2007 to 2008, he became a visiting fellow for the, Brick, Brook, the prestigious Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. Published many articles and books. He's definitely a renowned expert. And Dr. Tolaraya, we are honored to receive you at this time. We wanna thank our UPF of Russia and Europe and the Middle East, uh, Mr. Jacques Marion and also uh, Mark Brand for introducing you to our forum. We welcome you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. And uh, uh, I would like to be as brief as possible uh, because I presume the topic of today's uh, conference is more uh, not the relation between the great powers, but how they influence the Korean situation because the, uh, the Korean uh, unification is the uh, thing we're talking about. Uh, but, well, uh, reacting to uh, Dugan guys' uh, presentations, which very uh, adequately, I think, uh, represent U.S. point of view. I would just be brief uh, to say that it's not uh, fully compatible with Russian point of view. I don't represent an official is, uh, uh, institution, but uh, what I see from the uh, narrative uh, in Russia and from a broader perspective, including those in BRICS, countries, which are Brazil, Russia, India, uh, uh, China, and uh, South Africa. Uh, uh, the, uh, the overwhelming view is a little bit different. And that was especially shown during the COVID era, uh, which in fact saw the uh, rise of nationalism and isolationism in many countries and the disruption of the overall uh, global order. And so what we see is that the uh, old uh, post-liberal uh, world order is given uh, it, uh, uh, place of something new, which we don't know yet how it will look like. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, greatest uh, uh, discrepancy between uh, uh, these countries, BRICS countries, and uh, uh, for example, and uh, U.S. point of view is that uh, U.S. still considers to be the dominant, the, the leader of the world. Well, it certainly is the leader of the part of the world, of the Western world, but it cannot fully be, uh, be called a unilateral power of today's uh, global situation. There, there are several centers with different influence, but the world has already become multipolar and it will be increasingly uh, be, uh, do so. Uh, of course, uh, the, rise, the rise of China is more spectacular. And uh, I appreciate uh, guys mentioned Fuki did uh, uh, well this danger of, of war, but well I think that it can be prevented uh, because well China uh, is uh, will continue rise even if uh, uh, somebody would try to stop at economic development uh, is the uh, biggest country in the world in population terms it has a, uh, now their own technological base. So regardless of its uh, cooperation with the West, it will grow. Maybe not so spectacular, but will continue to grow. And um, mm -hmm. uh, what uh, well, I personally like more about China, uh, that it, uh, it surely wants to uh, increase its clout, its uh, role in international affairs, but it do, do not try to force its uh, uh, rules, political system, or way of life on others. Uh, and uh, thus it uh, might not become the leader of the world, the unipolar center of the world like US uh, used to be, 
uh, and uh, this is reassuring. And um, now with this uh, growing confrontation and some people in Russia call it pre-war situation, uh, which is very unfortunate. Uh, there is a strong stimulus for Russia and China to get, uh, to get closer together. Uh, because, well, actually, uh, unlike uh, Russia, uh, unlike US and China, who have this, well, uh, existential contradiction of who is, the, who is the boss in this world, uh, uh, US and, and Russia do not have that kind of contradictions. Uh, we can cooperate, although any ideas that uh, uh, Russia can be driven away uh, from, uh, from, from, uh, from China now, they're uh, very ill-based. And I would tell frankly that uh, uh, Putin's government is very consistent in that. And uh, just to disappoint uh, somebody, uh, even if we imagine that uh, Putin would leave the political scene and there would be free election in Russia, I think that uh, anybody who will come uh, to, to his place will be even more nationalistic and more, uh, you know, uh, authoritarian than uh, we, have, we have now. That's a democracy, that's the will of the people. Um, so, um, uh, uh, so, well, how does this influence the, uh, the Korean uh, situation? Uh, I would say that the uh, Korean situation uh, that, uh, that uh, both Russia and China are very close in uh, appraising the Korean situation and the prospects of the developments in the Korean Peninsula, uh, because both countries have a long, long history of uh, uh, cooperation with uh, North Korea. Uh, well, Russia, USSR, in fact, created this country, and uh, they're interested in keeping the status quo at its borders. Uh, because, uh, well, actually, uh, when we speak about these contradictions, it's uh, not Russian uh, uh, aircraft carriers or Russian uh, warships which are, uh, which are raiding the, uh, the, uh, the ocean near Florida, but it's, it's British ship which, which goes into Russian territorial waters, so obviously uh, Russia feels uh, uh, concerned about that. Um, so... Um, uh, therefore, this, uh, the Korea, which is across the river from both Russia and China, not across the ocean like U.S., it's a, a sort of a place uh, where, where both Russia and China would keep, to be, to keep uh, quiet and uh, transform rather than uh, have a crisis, uh, even if the situation with, uh, after unification would uh, become more beneficial. And uh, in fact, due to uh, the recent events, uh, uh, North Korea has uh, strengthened its position to the extent that the, uh, the possibility of war conflicts here has diminished. Uh, well, whether do we like it or not, but, uh, uh, but North Korea, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, both its uh, human rights violations and its self-sustainable economy uh, due, due to COVID, became uh, less a strange thing to the rest of the world because that's what actually many countries are doing. Uh, moreover, uh, North Korea has become self-sufficient in its uh, defense, uh, in, in its defense. Um, because uh, while the uh, missile and nuclear shield it has created, uh, it's a strong deterrent uh, against, uh, well, any uh, attack from outside, and I don't believe that North Korea is still thinking about, uh, well, attacking somebody like, well, conquering South Korea, unless, of course, provoked, but uh, this is something that we can uh, keep a, a lead on. Uh, well, uh, in fact, North Koreans now consider that they have a sort of strategic parity uh, with the United States. And uh, maybe this period uh, in the post-war, or at least post-Cold War history in the Korean Peninsula is one of the uh, most stable, because this confrontational stability suggests that if uh, nobody uh, makes some great provocations, the situation could go like this for years and maybe decades. Uh, so it's the best of the worst scenarios, I think. Uh, so, uh, uh, actually, now uh, 
uh, U.S. Uh, de facto sees North Korea uh, as a nuclear power, as a nuclear state. Although, of course, nobody, uh, not, neither U.S., nor China, nor Russia will ever recognize this uh, legally uh, because it will undermine the NPT regime. But still, in the political calculations, uh, uh, there's, uh, I think, very little hope for denuclearization. Uh, what we can talk about now is arms control and arms reduction, but denuclearization is something that should be declared. But I don't think that denuclearization of Korean Peninsula could come before the denuclearization of the other countries and a radical, drastic reduction in the nuclear, uh, in nuclear arms effect in world politics, uh, which I do, do not think will necessarily uh, increase uh, stability. Uh, so uh, uh, that means that uh, uh, we have to uh, we have to recognize this reality. And what I think uh, uh, that uh, uh, U.S. new administration, Biden administration, might be considering. Uh, but uh, uh, North Koreans, of course, they are showing. That they're not, uh, that they do not need any diplomacy. They they do not need any uh, foreign help or cooperation, which complicates things and raises the stakes. However, um, I should say that uh, Russia and China uh, see very close eye to eye on that. They want to engage uh, North Korea. They uh, want to uh, to diminish the uh, level of threat uh, in Korean Peninsula. And uh, while uh, sanctions are concerned, uh, I, I've got the feeling that China, uh, well, is, is doing a lot of assistance to, uh, to uh, North Korea. Uh, actually, uh, I know from UN materials that uh, there are hundreds of ships going in and out from uh, North Korea, uh, exporting prohibited commodities and in the, importing, them, importing them, including coal and petroleum. So um, Chinese support does uh, give North Korea the possibility to, to, uh, to move on. Uh, and uh, the relations with South Korea are uh, not so good, but this is North Korean choice because now they have the government uh, that, uh, that will uh, really is the best uh, ever in relation to North Korea. What North Koreans want is they want uh, some kind of a, a meaningful and equal dialogue with the United States, and not just simply, uh, not just simply, well, the tit for tat, uh, uh, action for action approach, but a general one which was tried under Trump, uh, but uh, it didn't succeed. So North Koreans uh, now they don't they say they don't settle for uh, some small things. They want some some bigger. Uh, and more general approach uh, in recognizing them as a separate state, as a, uh, well, equal uh, state. And uh, uh, this can lead to some uh, of the uh, uh, reduction intentions and a risk reduction. Well, uh, I don't know how it will work out, but one thing is um, clear for me that, uh, uh, that none of the countries uh, uh, of the great powers we're talking about, really see the prospect for uh, Korean unification in near future. Uh, fortunately or not, but uh, we still, uh, most of us presume that there will be Korean states. And in fact, two Korean uh, sub nations or sub ethnicities for, for a long time to come. And uh, this is the reality we should think. And uh, the best possible scenario in my mind is, well, some kind of evolution of North Korea to become a uh, normal uh, or well, conventional country, conventionalization, uh, that, that I call it, uh, cooperating uh, with South Korea and cooperating with its neighbors. But to get there, we should, uh, uh, there is a need uh, to diminish the sense of danger and uh, uh, the feeling of uh, threat uh, North, Koreans, uh, North Koreans feel. And the, the only way is uh, he here to join hands between at least three, group, uh, three great powers. And also maybe uh, with the, uh, with the uh, participation of uh, other party talks members. Uh, thank you, I think I've, I've done. 
I used my time already. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tolaraya. And I'd like to ask our team to put all three panelists on together with me so that we can have some discussion here. And I'd like the panelists to all unmute uh, their microphones. We have quite a number of uh, questions coming in. And I might say uh, our, our team just informed me that over 100 uh, Russians have registered and, and are participating in the program, either by YouTube or, or by direct uh, Zoom link. Uh, very honored to welcome our Russian uh, uh, participants and also uh, uh, audience. In fact, I might turn to a question from Russia right away. Um, Dmitry has sent us some uh, very good questions. Tatiana, the musician in St. Petersburg, Russia, says that World War II, my father was a pilot and they were shipping airplanes from Alaska to Russia over the Bering Strait. Our contacts with the people in America was always very friendly. We could, we should go beyond discussing personal Putin Biden politics. Can we do that? Can the presenters propose people to people friendship projects to improve US Russia balance? Can Russia uh, join in friendship? Uh, Dr. Mondo, could you respond to that? What are the potential of Russia and US uh, becoming friendly again and working together? Well, the starting point, which thankfully uh, President Putin and President Biden picked up, was uh, having ambassadors back in the embassy. And what we've got to do is reverse the policy of the last several years, where every time an issue came up, we engaged in sending people home. It was retaliation. It was a penalty. We need to talk to each other. So I think the starting point is to have fully staffed embassies that are able to talk to government officials and to private people. We want to have visas uh, provided. Uh, both uh, the, the Russian embassy in the U.S., the American embassy in Moscow have trouble. The, the consulates actually providing uh, visas to people. We want people to uh, visit one another. And I agree. I think what's extraordinarily important is to have people contact. Because, again, you know, the transformation, I mean, Guy mentioned the, you know, you know, the, this idea that of young people of having uh, you know, kind of transforming societies we want people involved. We want them to know what's going on. We want them to engage one another. And I think those ties are extraordinarily important and they should be in business. They should be in culture. You know, they should be in all manner of kind of human life, tourism, all of these things I think are advantageous. So I would like to see what uh, Presidents Putin and Biden agreed to as the start, that we can at least start reversing this assumption that the other side is evil you know, that our ties with Russia go back a very long time. They go back much before the Soviet Union. They go back into the uh, 1800s. Uh, they were very friendly in those years. Uh, the Russian Empire was friendly with the Union and the question of uh, during the Civil War. So those contacts, I think we should look at and uh, try to revive and remember the wartime partnership in World War II. You know, politics is not everything. We need to, we need to be able to look at things beyond that. Very good, Guy. Any yeah, I think that it's uh, America can cooperate. Or yeah, I, I do. I, I think it's it's. Uh, I think there's a question about whether or not the the Russian and U.S. governments should be facilitating uh, these uh, these di dialogues and exchanges uh, by granting things like more education-based visas. Uh, to both sides or encouraging or financing or pro providing incentives for uh, younger people to experience uh, for Russians to come to the United States or for Americans to spend time in Russia? Or is this something that, that can be left to private organizations and the private side of civil society? There's always a, a bit of a rub there, you know, um, is it something where uh, an organization like the Cato Institute, Doug, could uh, be more engaged in joint uh, dialogue and programs with Russian civil society organs, whether those Russian civil society organs were connected to the Russian government or not? Um, I think the U.S.-India uh, uh, dialogues of uh, the last 10 years or so uh, the United States government and the Indian government um, agreed uh, at the top level to begin a process of two plus two dialogues. 
And there are some uh, dialogues like that between the U.S. and Russia, but I think there that there should be uh, there should be more. And and I think American universities can play a bigger role in this, and so can Russian universities. Um, so I'm I'm a major proponent of it, and I also uh, I'm a major uh, uh, proponent of um, Georgie Tolaraya's point of how can we get beyond just the Biden Putin level discussion here and look at the sort of a much deeper connection between the U.S. and Russia, uh, and it's an economic connection as well. I mean, remember. Uh, despite Russia's economic struggle or the portrayal of that struggle in the American media at the moment, uh, the Russia remains a pretty major potential market for some big transnational American companies, whether it's Ford Motors or uh, Apple Computers, you name it, they all want to do business in Russia. So there's an economic component to this as well. And uh, I, you know, I think it requires um, an initiative by whoever's in power in Washington and in the Kremlin. And just to finish this thought, there's trouble with that because it also requires a certain behavior by the leadership. And when the U.S. intelligence community agrees across the board, regardless of who's in the White House, that the Putin government meddled in the 2016 election or tried to manipulate social media or that I go as a journalist and I interview the the recently re retired uh, chief of U.S. counterintelligence in the directorate of intelligence in Washington. And he tells me there's no doubt that if Russian intelligence wanted, it could stop the wave of ransomware attacks hitting U.S. agencies and companies. That type of thing uh, erodes American trust in uh, the pursuit of things like civil society dialogue with Russian organizations. So there's an issue of, of transparency and the need for responsibility and leadership uh, on both sides. Dr. Tolaraya, uh, the question has come in, does Russia support North Korea having uh, ICBM and deliverable warheads that could strike the United States? Does Russia and want to see this? We understand China doesn't want to see this. It's it's, it could lead to more proliferation and development. What's Russia's view on possible you know, development of the deliverable warheads? Well, we're absolutely against it. Uh, well, both by the reasons that, uh, uh, that would raise uh, tension and because it would undermine the, uh, the uh, deterrent, the Russian own deterrent nuclear and the missile uh, deterrent. So we're absolutely against it. And uh, we uh, never uh, hesitated to tell uh, North Koreans in very uh, clear terms about it. Uh, so this is just uh, absolute, uh, uh, absolutely clear position. But may I also comment uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the previous uh, US speakers uh, about people to people exchanges. Uh, you know, well, uh, when I grew up in Soviet Union, uh, well, uh, U.S., United States was seen as a sort of, uh, not as exactly as the beacon, but as a sort of example to follow. And we enjoyed, well, the U.S. Uh, US uh, culture, U.S. Uh, music. I remember how, uh, how happy I was when I got myself my first pair of American jeans, you know. And uh, it's sort of changed in 1990s because uh, Russian... Uh, public was very much eager to embrace, uh, to be a part of the, uh, this free world. But instead, uh, many people felt that they were downgraded, that the Russia was downgraded to a secondary power, which is very uh, offensive uh, to Russians. And also democracy, has, it's become a sort of cursor reward in Russia because the uh, democracy that we had in, in 1990s, it's... Uh, uh, really meant the uh, rule of uh, gangsters and, uh, well, some filthy politicians. Uh, so um, I think that should be understood that uh, now there is a lot of suspicion in general public uh, against the U.S. Uh, citizens and uh, any private people-to-people uh, -people contacts are seen just a vehicle to 
to to to get uh, to influence uh, a Russian internal situation and most of the people see that uh, think that US wants a revolution in Russia that they want to change the regime and uh, we had enough of revolutions we're fed up with changes of the regime so whatever people may think of the current regime it doesn't want US to meddle into its internal affairs but of course uh, I support the need uh, for more exchanges and more uh, free movement of people uh, well I myself am now in New York and I cannot get my uh, my family in here because uh, they cannot get the visa so uh, this is uh, something outrageous. And um, th I think that the current th uh, in relations, improvement of the relations, could uh, make room for more exchanges and uh, between NGOs as well. Because now in Russia, the uh, uh, NGO which is supported by uh, US is uh, seen as a sort of a spy agency. And uh, I think the same is in, in US because, well, um, uh, Organizations like uh, Russian TV, TV uh, Russia Today, or others uh, are seen as a sort of a, a government instrument to undermine the U.S. by propaganda. So this is the reality which, we, which I think we should be overcome. Thank you. This is a question for all the participants. Uh, there is reported uh, mass starvation going on again in North Korea. Food production has dropped to the lowest rate for many years. And well, why can't China just step in and make sure there's ample food to be able to survive? Why doesn't Russia or Russia or China or the United States step in? Any comments from any of our panel? Well, North Korea is very independent. It's always played uh, the Soviet Union and Russia versus China. It, uh, uh, it takes very seriously the sen historic sense of being a shrimp among whales. Of, I think one reason it's wanted to have an opening with the U.S. is to have a little more independence. And they have essentially closed themselves off uh, with uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. And there's been somewhat more opening, we think, uh, in terms of trade and stuff more recently. Uh, they have really shut themselves off and they're very hesitant to admit to the world the problems they have. Kim Jong-un just gave a speech to the uh, Workers' Party of Korea talking about uh, food tensions. And more, more ominously, he talked about an arduous march, which is how they referred to the, the famine from the 1990s. So I think that uh, there's a very real danger there. I, I think this is an area where Russia, China, and the U.S. could work together. The question of how to put together an aid program and how to approach North Korea in a way that the North would not feel its sovereignty to be threatened, but to indicate a willingness of all three countries to, uh, to help it. Uh, I think it's, it's scary. If the, the 1990s were a horrid time for North Korea, we don't have much sense of what's going on right now because there aren't many uh, foreigners in. The, many of the embassies have closed. The aid workers have been sent home or have left. Uh, but the, the rhetoric we're hearing, uh, I think, is very, very uh, concerning. And it's an area I hope we can do something on. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, in North Korea, the regime authorities has now uh, more as a priority to keep in control uh, in, inside the country and, well, actually passing to a new stage of centralized um, economic uh, governance, uh, then, well, to the well-being of uh, the population. Because... Uh, either uh, China or Russia, as we have uh, or in fact uh, suggested that they cannot get inside their aid uh, into North Korea because the borders are closed. So North Koreans just uh, say to us, thank you, no, we, we will survive. And uh, to, uh, they say to the US and uh, uh, South Korea, well, we don't need you at all. Uh, so this is the reality. I don't know how to change it. Uh, the situation uh, should be uh, quite difficult now. And I'm a little bit concerned about the possible uh, instability because like in the 1990s, they were far farming. The people didn't know other way of life. Now they have got some experience of a better life. So I'm not really sure why uh, North Koreans are doing this or how it can be overcome. But the situation is not so good. 
Thank you. That's excellent. We we agree. Uh, we have some further sessions in this three day conference that are going to touch on exactly that point. Um, Guy, uh, the proposal, uh, Dr. Tolaraya mentioned it, and Doug, if you could comment. Um, this has been a long standing discussion about denuclearization and that Korea will never, North Korea will never stop its quest for nuclear weapons uh, until the other parties all denuclearize. And uh, what, are, what are the possible steps to even looking at that issue? I know it's, uh, some people wouldn't even look at it, but eventually there has to be a more safe situation around the world. We're right now using balance of power, but what, what, what steps would be done to all three of our panelists to even discuss uh, ending the nuclear era? Um, I could take this one. I think uh, before I do, and I'll, I'll be very brief, I just want to add something about how, my agreement with uh, Georgie and Doug that it actually is the Kim regime in Pyongyang that's got uh, rules in place to prevent the movement of humanitarian aid into North Korea. And I, I just want to point out why, because I, I sometimes think we blow past why does the Kim regime stop humanitarian aid from going into its own people? It's because there's a very deep fear in the regime that the Americans and the South Koreans and possibly even the Chinese and the Russians are gonna use the humanitarian aid channel to sneak communications devices and Western or some sort of revolutionary propaganda into North Korea. It's important to remember that. And, and I think that there are efforts, particularly by the South Koreans, and they get criticized in Washington a lot to try and give assurances to the North that if the Kim regime opens the channel of humanitarian aid, that channel will not be exploited to, to move these kind of things into North Korea. That, that aside, with, with regard to what steps could be taken immediately or initially, I think we look at the Singapore summit and the Hanoi summit, and the, the takeaways, you know, the, the way these summits are portrayed in, in mainstream American media is that they failed to produce a denuclearization agreement. That may be so, but these summits were historic, uh, not just because of the optics that Donald Trump, the US president was meeting with the head of Chairman Kim, the head of the, the North Korean government. They were also historic because there were things that came about. And one of the things that came about was a very clear understanding of the North Korean demand that the United States also denuclearize. And there's all this debate about what does that mean? And I think the first thing that it, that it means or the interpretation, the consensus of, of North Korea watchers in the US government and intelligence community and civil society is that it means reducing the U.S. nuclear deterrence shield in Northeast Asia. Not the U.S. giving up all its nuclear weapons, but, but pulling back or proving that there are not U.S. nuclear weapons based in South Korea, that there are not U.S. nuclear weapons based on ships floating around in waters near North Korea, that there are not U.S. nuclear, wep uh, nuclear weapons based in Japan, that there are not US nuclear weapons based in Guam even. That I think is what the North Koreans are referring to. And um, the, the Trump administration would, would uh, play, pay a little bit of lip service to acknowledging that that's what the North Koreans were referring to. The Biden administration hasn't touched it at all. And the American side doesn't want to touch that because the American side knows that the presence of that nuclear shield is there, not just for North Korea, it's also there uh, for China and for Russia, that the United States has, has the, the nuclear uh, weapons in the region uh, because of, of perceived threats from uh, both Beijing and Moscow. I mean, I would, su I would suggest that you know, we maintain a clear desire for denuclearization, but we look for smaller deals that in a sense are arms control. 
And I think the Hanoi summit offered that in the sense that, you know, Chairman Kim suggested closing down Yongbyon. He wanted sanctions relief. We can argue how much sanction relief he deserved, but that strikes me, that's diplomacy. You know, that is, that is the negotiation. You sit down and you say, we like the idea of seeing Yongbyon closed down. You know, you want this, we're prepared to give this, try to come to some conclusion where what you're achieving is you're reducing the danger. And to my mind, then let's be on the road that moves us towards denuclearization. And honestly, if we get to a point where we've capped a North Korean program, we've limited their production, we've put the restraints on potential proliferation, I'm going to be much less concerned. What scares me now is the Rand Corporation and the Son Institute have a report out, that say by 2027, North Korea could have 200 nuclear weapons. That is a scary number. So to my mind, our priority should be making sure that doesn't happen. Let's make sure it doesn't go to 200. You know, I'd love to get it to zero, but the starting point is making sure it doesn't go up. And I think that you know, the, the Singapore summit, the statement had also a sense of you know, indicating the importance of better bilateral relations, the importance of the regional environment, that uh, you know, I'm skeptical of you know, how committed is Chairman Kim to actually give all of the nuclear weapons away, but certainly he's not going to do so if he doesn't think he can trust the U.S. and trust the environment committed. So again, that gives us an impetus to say, how do we have a better relationship in which it is more believable to him uh, that he is more secure giving up nuclear weapons and keeping them? And to me, that's the ultimate goal. We have to convince them they are better off and more secure not having nuclear weapons than having them. That's not going to be easy, but we need to work hard at that because the alternative is a very different environment that is not good for any of us. Ambassador Christopher Hill, former ambassador to Korea with the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, head of the six-party delegation from the United States, also Ambassador Joe Detrani, they're going to be on tomorrow. Um, they're both advocating to the Biden administration engagement and dialogue. What do our panelists here think, and starting with Dr. Georgie, uh, what do you think about the six-party talks resuming? Uh, well, uh, yes, thank you. First, I would like to comment on the first uh, uh, issue. Well, I think we, we have to learn to live with North Korea as a nuclear power. And I don't uh, think that, uh, uh, well, uh, under Kim Jong-un, there could be much of a compromise because he tried compromise wise, once in Hanoi. And uh, what he suggested was a really big step uh, forward. I didn't expect them to... Uh, close to suggest to close the complex, which is a very big one, and it's the heart of North Korean nuclear program. In fact, um, if they would have done it, uh, their progress in acquiring new uh, weaponry and new nuclear materials would be just marginal. Uh, and I, I, I believe, uh, as far as I know, that not everybody in the North Korean leadership, especially the military, suggested supported this move. But uh, Kim uh, took to, he took his own uh, responsibility, and well, he put his uh, uh, authority on the, on the on, on stake, and he was rebuffed. And this is a deep personal insult that he's not going to do it again. I think, as as far as as he, as he remembers this experience, I believe that what he wanted was um, well you know, to become something like Vietnam for the United States, which also uh, fought a war with Vietnam. But then uh, they became is, is not exactly friendly, but, uh, well, with normal relations on a sort of anti-Chinese platform. That's what I think Kim's, was Kim's, uh, and well, the establishment's idea and uh, strategy. They didn't work out, and I don't think it ever will. And Kim understands that now. As for the well, number of the nuclear uh, weaponry and uh, delivery means, which uh, of course Russia uh, wouldn't like to see uh, happen, because it also undermines their own security and it gives the pretext for US to keep more arms in the region. I think that uh, the only way is to try to limit and to uh, uh, first thing, and second thing is to have a normal relationship. After all, uh, even one terrorist uh, with a vial of some anthrax is much more uh, dangerous in the US, for the U.S. than uh, uh, even a, a country which is, uh, if, uh, uh, which is not hostile. 
for example, nobody cares about uh, about uh, say Pakistan or India uh, being a threat to the United States because they are well, uh, they are countries with good relations. So I don't think uh, North Korea would be eager to remain hostile uh, country. So there are the two ways. First uh, way to uh, to uh, increase dialogue with North Korea to 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 make it a sort of normal. Uh, an unthreatable one, and second, to reduce uh, and limit the, um, the arms. Thing. And as for six party talks, I'm sorry, I think uh, we'll have we will speak about it tomorrow. But now, the most important thing I uh, I think is the start of the U.S. Uh, North Korean uh, dealing. But of course, in the end, um, uh, the final deal should be coordinated with all these six parties. Uh, have most stakes here, and uh, uh, they can also provide guarantees uh, for the fulfillment of the agreement. But this is quite a long way off. Thank you, Guy. Any comments on the six-party talks? I I uh, really appreciate um, uh, Georgie Tolaraya's points here about the North Koreans feeling that they have strategic parity with the US um, at this point. I, and I can't emphasize enough right now what's happened in the last month or two months. The Biden administration has appointed a new special envoy, someone with a lot of experience uh, in the region, a, a, a career ambassador, uh, Ambassador Kim, who, who was in, in Singapore, uh, or who was instrumental in helping the Trump administration set up the Singapore summit. This is who the Biden administration picked to be the new envoy. And uh, this envoy was in South Korea in recent days, uh, giving overtures to the North Koreans saying, we wanna talk, we wanna talk. We really wanna talk with you. Would you please talk with us? Uh, so I, there's an awareness on the US side that Kim Jong-un feels like he was spurned in Hanoi and in personally insulted. And the Biden administration's return to strategic patience, you, you know, whether, whether conservatives in Washington and the American domestic political game are gonna criticize Biden or not, or whether there are concerns that Biden might not be interested in complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. The Biden administration is in power in Washington and it's reaching out to the North Koreans repeatedly on the world stage saying, we want to talk no preconditions. And what are we getting in response from Kim Jong-un is we're getting Kim Jong-un's sister saying um, she's, you know, insulted by the American overture. We're getting Kim Jong-un not responding. We're getting other top advisors in the regime saying, no way, there aren't going to be talks. So the, the Kim regime uh, is at risk of, of basically looking belligerent. And when we compare it to other nuclear armed powers around the world, I think Pakistan is a really good example because there's great concern in Washington about what to do about you know, Pakistan and its nuclear weapons. The Pakistani government, if Washington says, hey, let's talk, we want to talk with you, uh, the Pakistani government responds by saying, w would you like to come to Islamabad and we'll roll out the red carpet or could we come to the White House? We'd love to talk with you. So there's When it comes to the idea of six party talks, at some point, the onus of responsibility falls on the North Koreans, the same way that it falls on the North Koreans to allow some aid into the country to prevent starvation. The North Koreans could say, we'll only allow Chinese and Russian aid in. That's it. All the aid has to, humanitarian aid has to go through uh, Russia and China. How would the West respond to that? We want, we don't want people to starve in North Korea. We want COVID vaccines to go in. So the, the, the onus at some point, it's the same with talks. If the, if the North Koreans say we'll only do six party talks, no more just talking with the Americans or the South Koreans unilaterally. We only want six party talks. The Americans want dialogue at this point. They wanted it when they had a conservative government in the White House. They want it now that they have a liberal government in the White House. At some point, the onus is on the North Koreans to say, let's have dialogue. Thank you. Doug, you had something? Yeah, I think Guy is absolutely right. Uh, the response of, the, uh, of Kim 
And I mean, the last time d- delivered by his sister, who has done this in the past, was a very strong rejection of, I think, an extraordinarily important overture with Ambassador Kim making it very clear this administration is not sitting around waiting for the North Koreans. This administration wants to engage them. So I think that uh, we may want to talk about five party talks. Any kind of a peace regime in the region is going to require the involvement of Russia, of Japan, of China, as well as the U.S. and South Korea. That's inevitable. And we might go ahead and tell the North Koreans, look, we would love to talk to you in any forum and any format. It can be one on one. It can be two on one. whatever you want. We're willing to do. And if you don't want to, we're going to talk to everybody else here because we all have a stake in a peaceful Northeast Asia. We all have a stake in a North Korea that's successful, a North Korea whose people are taken care of, a North Korea that's part of this larger peaceful order. We all want that. I think we would want to hold that out. Maybe that would encourage them to join. You know, there may be internal dynamics we're not aware of. I mean, now there's, you know, there's concern about, you know, Kim's health I and mean, he's losing weight. I mean, you know, that, that could be good. Maybe it's not good. We don't know. Uh, they've made some changes in coming up with essentially a deputy head of the party. There's a talk about, does that sit you? Know, so, there's, you know, internally, we, we, we look through a glass darkly unfortunately, in trying to see what's going on. But I think Guy is absolutely right that ultimately we can't make the North Koreans do what they should do. What we want to do is provide them with every opportunity and make it very clear it's not us who are holding things up. If Chairman Kim wants sanctions relief, if Chairman Kim wants economic growth, we are ready to work with him. And, uh, you know, and, and others in the region are as well. And let's hold that out. And my hope is that they will eventually reciprocate. Very good. One uh, final question. Uh, UPF has been supporting, and I know there's some very significant support inside Russia for the developing the friendship and further economic trade between Russia and the U.S. And in part, in part, a proposal has been made for a Bering Strait tunnel and bridge to connect Alaska and Russia for trade. Uh, any thoughts on that? Dr. Tolaraya? Uh, 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 well, uh, uh, that might be a very symbolic initiative, uh, although, well, there's, uh, uh, there's not much of a uh, trade potential uh, in these areas, and I find it more just to uh, reestablish the normal, uh, the normal channels for uh, communication in economic um, economic uh, cooperation and the first uh, step, well, uh, the most uh, important obstacle to this are U.S. sanctions because no U.S. bank can, uh, uh, can well, cooperate with Russian banks and even the, I encountered that even the third country's ba- bank which are, ba- uh, which are uh, related to U.S. financial system refuse uh, to deal with Russian banks and, uh, well, so how can we uh, uh, how can we find a solution unless there is some kind of a change in this situation? Very good. Okay, Guy or Doug, on that issue or any other final comments? I think that the I, I agree the symbolic, these are symbolic initiatives. The idea of, of that type of a project, from a realist perspective, I, I think it's it's almost um, fantastic to, to Unless there's a private uh, American interest behind it, the idea of of having that type of an infrastructure project happen, I think it's it's just unre- unrealistic. Um, but it, that doesn't mean that it's not positive to talk about it because if you have a positive symbolic initiative like that, it becomes an opening for positive uh, dialogue about something, even if it's a fantastic idea. And I think that the US and Russia need uh, openings to have positive dialogue now more than ever. I, I, I think I look at the US-Russia relationship as being, it still hasn't even gotten into a healing place yet. The wounds of, of the last six or seven years of you know, revanchist Russian policy, the Americans aren't awake to, to the point that that Georgie uh, was making here, that at, after the Cold War, 
there was a lot of animosity in, in Russian society and Russian civil society that the Americans were downgrading Russia's status in the eyes of the Americans. That, that animosity is still there. Vladimir Putin's revanchist posture is derived from that. It, it draws its momentum from that. And this kind of clash that we've had uh, of the last decade, the last five years particularly, is all tied to that. And I don't think we're in a healing space yet. So these initiatives are, I talk of something like a tunnel from Alaska to Russia. We need, we need things like that to rally around, to create dialogue that's positive. I, 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 the last one I'll say is, is um, as dark and, and gloomy as it is, the idea of a joint effort to combat climate change. Um, you know, this is divisive in the U.S., but it's a common interest of the Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans to try and address uh, the issue of climate change. Uh, the, the problem is, do you put climate change out in front of something like strategic uh, stability and, and nuclear arms agreements architecture? Or do you use it as an excuse, for instance, to not talk about strategic stability uh, those are some of the issues on the table going forward. Good. Uh, not everybody, not everybody, well, uh, share the views on uh, climate change in Russia, you know. I don't have a, a good sense of the logistics. It strikes me, given the, the climate in the Straits, and the, that these are probably be difficult projects. I think that Guy has the right idea, which is this is the kind of thing that could move us to talk about the, the essentials of the relationship. I mean, the starting point to me is we've got to start backing away from sanctions, that if you want to have a commercial relationship, even rolling back a couple of them would be the start of a positive relationship that can get us to talk about what kind of investments, you know, what kind of projects can we work on together that could be very helpful. And I think the symbolism of can we connect ourselves, because there is something unique about a, a bridge where there's that feeling that we, we really are suddenly one continent as opposed to separated uh, you know, continents, that I think that visual is very powerful. And that, I think, could be very helpful. And I hope this administration, that at least the tone that was set between Biden and Putin allows us to start thinking about, okay, what are things that we would you know, be prepared to do? What would we want Russia to do? Can we start to pull back from this mutual animosity that we've had, which is in neither country's interest? And I think, again, you know, going beyond politics, the commercial relationships could be very useful. I'd love to see us move in that direction. Final point, one minute each, if you would just comment on uh, your advice for the Biden administration in relation to North Korea and relations with China and Russia. Any advice you'd like to give? Just a short thought on that. I'm happy to quickly go first. And go it's very simple. I, I think that Biden, what I'm seeing, even though the Biden foreign policy hasn't calcified yet, we're, we're just past 100 days a, a, a month or so ago, we're we're not quite there, we're still in the first year, but what I'm seeing is that when it comes to China and it comes to Russia and that dynamic of US, China, Russia, what Biden wants is not, and what he's trying to get, it looks like so far, is not so different from what uh, the Trump administration wanted and what Donald Trump wanted. It's just Biden's style is really, really very different. It's much softer, it's, it's pandering to the left to a degree. But the interest, the U.S. grand strategic interests are the same, mm. and uh, I, you know, I, I think that that's that's uh, something that that we should we should consider going forward. Here is uh, it, it's you know, is the Biden administration? Uh, my advice would be to remember the 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 mantra of peace through strength, and that my advice to the Biden administration, although I, I am a neutral journalist covering it trying to be is is uh not to be too weak to remember that america america has this tremendous power particularly in the military economic diplomatic and informational realms and not to pander to autocracy or not to not and i don't think the biden administration is doing that but it would it would be my encouragement i i have this discussion with with various people in the administration about this as a journalist now 
And uh, I think there's awareness in the administration of that, but that would be my, my advice is not to turn soft. Dr. Tolaraya, any advice for the Biden administration? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, just to be short, I just uh, repeat what I said, uh, do something practical. For example, the sanctions on, on, the, th on the three of these countries. Very good, okay. Dr. Bondo. I think the reality is that if we have a bad relationship with China and Russia, we can't expect a lot from them in terms of dealing with North Korea. That uh, from their standpoint, they don't have a lot of incentive to help us if they perceive we are you know, going after them in other ways. Uh, I th and I think second is to realize that there's a limitation on how much they can do, that North Korea is independent. It is not controlled by them. They influence it. But I, you know, the North Korea is on its own. It's always been on its own. So I would, I would certainly try to work with them, but realize it's going to have to be conducted in context of our larger relationship. And that ultimately what we do with North Korea is going to depend on us and it's going to depend on the North Koreans. That uh, let's, let's worry about what we can control and be realistic about that and then realize that it's going to be out of our hands at some point. Well, we certainly want to thank. Go ahead, Doctor Georgie. Uh, just, uh, just a small bit about North Korea. You know, that's uh, there's a lot of uh, public and experts, uh, in both in China, I think, and in Russia, which uh, still believe that the final goal of uh, U.S. in Northeast Asia is just eliminating North Korea, just well, uh, making it disappear. So, well, with a mood like this, how can we frankly tell North Koreans, well? Uh, you know, you should be more friendly, more forthcoming. It's, uh, it's you know, it's just very difficult to be to be frank. And frankness is the most important thing we have in relation with North Korea. Thank you to all of our panelists. It's been an excellent session, and we want to invite all of you back soon. Uh, we are now going to go to our next session at 2 p.m., and we will have another panel of experts. And we thank also uh, our European counterparts uh, with UPF there, Dr. Jacques Marion and, and Mark Brand, and also our Russian UPF family there. Uh, very, very grateful for your uh, engagement and bringing so many Russians to the program. We certainly look forward to a strong friendship and alliance by solving these problems. And hopefully North and South Korea can finally come back together in a peaceful manner as they are one culture and one people. We thank all of you and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you to our audience.